the advantage of the uh, Q&A possibility that is open there. The question of inclusion of Roma is at the crossroad of what we call in our jargon in the European Union of the internal and external policies, especially the enlargement policy. The European Commission adopted the EU Roma strategy framework for equality, inclusion and participation on the 7th of October 2020. Last year, also in October, at the ministerial meeting in Albania was the follow up of the 2019 Poznan meeting and the declaration on Roma integration in the EU enlargement process. The EU and all of the Western Balkan countries make the move to endorse this vital strategy. The new Roma strategy proposes seven qualitative and quantitative targets for 2030. It's really time to deliver these Three of these objectives are horizontal in the areas of equality, inclusion and participation. And the other four are sectorial objectives in the areas of education, employment, housing and health. The European Commission requests that the Fundamental Rights Agency conduct a survey and assess the situation both in the EU and in the Balkan countries. In 2021, the survey would extend to Serbia and North, North Macedonia later this year. I'd like also to highlight that 15 years ago, the European Parliament adopted a resolution on the situation of Roma women in the European Union. It was adopted exactly on the 1st of June 2006, and it's exactly 15 years ago today. And the rapporteur is with us today. It was at the time Mrs. Yaroka. Uh, it brings me now to uh, our first speaker and to the panel. In uh, June 2004, Livia Yaroka was made history as the first member of Roma origin to be elected to the European Parliament in her constituency in Hungary. She has been proactive in addressing the discrimination that Roma people experience living in Europe not only in the EU member states, but also in the Balkans. As a member of the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee, she drafted in July 2020 a report for the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Roma Affairs regarding implementation of national Roma integration strategies, combating negative attitudes towards people with Romani background in Europe. And Mrs. Yaroka is also, as a vice president, member of the high level group on gender equality and diversity. So very much welcome to you, vice president, and uh, please start this event with your uh, keynote remarks. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank you the possibility so that the European Parliament's library is again dedicating an afternoon to such an important topic at such an important timing. And I'm uh, uh, especially honored because many of my role models and people who has contributed heavily to the fights of the Roma are on this panel today. And they are all from different generations. And it's wonderful to see that there are so many women who has a say and who has the power to change things. And I'm especially grateful uh, to many of the social organizations and civil society who helped us, the European Parliament, the Commission and the European Council to formulate the best possible strategies since we started out in 2004. As you said, we are talking about the biggest community now very heavily hit with COVID from the minority background in Europe. But there are so many around the Roma communities living in ghettos and poverty who are not from this origin. So our aim was that time in 2010 when the Hungarian presidency proposed uh, a council document is to include also those who are not Roma origin but very poor. And their children need to be educated with our children just like from all the children from all the strata. So the main message was integrated education, integrated workplace that time. We has come a very long way since then. 
And now I'm grateful for the Portuguese presidency, for Romeo Franz, Soraya Post, so many wonderful colleagues in the parliament uh, who contributed heavily uh, to this new document as well. And I'm happy that the commission was so um, brave to take on those uh, steps and proposals that were uh, might have seemed too far reaching in 2010. So we didn't dare to propose or the parliament did, uh, but other bodies, sometimes not even the civils dare to go that far. But we have now all those results as well with the clear objectives, with the inclusion of the Roma into the processes of not only leadership or token leadership, but real participation from preparing the projects not only in the local level, but at the highest level of the European Union as well. So these are important developments, but still what we are facing today, and, and uh, these will clearly say the problems, uh, the numbers I'm saying, but the good uh, uh, news is that we already have solutions for these heavy numbers. Because today still there are 86% of the Roma who leave education early, while the Europe 2020 early school leavers target is 10%. In addition, only 18% of Roma children transit to higher levels of education. So the early childhood development has never been more important tool than now. And whenever they ask me about what have I found as the most useful tool in the last years. And I had the chance to try out many because the Hungarian government has introduced many of my ideas from the tax lowering for big families to helping to build houses for mortgages with mortgages that doesn't have to be paid back. But the biggest intervention and now the Porto platform has clearly showed because this was the most important thing that Hungary was praised for, which is quite a rare occasion, but that was leaving children, not leaving children behind, but including them compulsorily in the kindergartens at the age of three. And this might sound very naive, but this is uh, the field that I feel has brought the most uh, to our Roma communities. And this is what I would like to propose to all of the European uh, countries. Of course, the rich countries where this is a possibility or other countries where there is a much bigger kindergarten culture and uh, in Finland, for example, even at the age of three months, uh, working mothers are able to take their children to, to very early kindergarten childcare. This is not the situation in Eastern Europe or in the Balkan. So it's extremely important. But when we talk about employment, the other important thing is 43% of the Roma are in a form of paid employment. The rest are unemployed. 63% of the young Roma are not in education, employment or, or training. And they are in very big danger. The coronavirus now clearly showed that, that uh, deviances, drug use, alcoholism, um, now pills, and very um, uh, dangerously, extremely dangerous fake um, drugs, chemical drugs, which are called bull and all, always changing their form. So the authorities cannot really ban them are, are uh, sickening our youngsters very much. So therefore, the other big um, um, step that I would like to ask the French presidency coming to propose very heavily to the member states are the vocational training possibilities. And so many types for many young mothers uh, uh, analphabet people. I have so many students who have already two children 23 years old, but still have only three degrees from the elementary school, cannot read and write. And these people cannot get a job, not even in the Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, shop as a cleaner, not even that we can do. So we have to uh, very quickly stop this gap between those people who have completely no education as they will be never able to enter the wonderful programs that the EU is providing money for. 
the third question was that we uh, tackled with the commission uh, in the last 15 years was the health insurance problems and the health problems all around Europe, as almost a quarter of the Roma have no national health insurances at all. And you can imagine what it meant uh, during the COVID crisis. Therefore, it was extremely important for us to lobby that without any insurances, people still get the vaccination and the test. Uh, that fourth question was neighborhood, but now with the recovery fund, I can see that the countries are opening up to understand that so many million people don't have toilets in Europe. And I hope, just like in Hungary, 20% of the recovery fund will go to Roma communities and 30 more percent will go to poor communities around Europe in Hungary. So I hope that this will be followed up in the other member states, because also, again, in many V4 countries in Romania, Bulgaria, Balkan, the living conditions are extremely harsh. Um, uh, they are so harsh, if you, if, you, if you dare me to say just few words, because they are shocking. No tap water in half of the uh, uh, houses where uh, there are no indoor flush toilets at all or showers and 80% of the Roma people in Europe live in overcrowded houses. So you can imagine what physical and psychological uh, reactions it triggers. Um, but as I said, we have uh, solutions for all of that and thank you very much uh, for the Roma platform to providing a place where these good ideas can be che uh, checked with each other. Uh, governments and prime ministers and ministers can be persuaded by the ideas of the civil society and the commission how to change things and luckily monitoring has changed also with this new new uh, next uh, 2030 roma strategy which was completely missing from the 2010 one though it was our most important message that time a quality monitoring where roma are also involved i will not go long I would also only like to inform you that in three months, in 2021 September, we will see what the member states propose. Until then, we must work with all the embassies, with all the ministers possible, all the permanent representations, lobbyist groups, to make these uh, um, already drawn up plans uh, accepted, uh, changed, if they are not good enough, because there is a huge experience now in the Commission, in the FRA, in the civil society on what works, what doesn't work. It's extremely important then that we get together very soon after that. And I was so happy to receive President Sassoli's invitation for a huge um, Roma gathering together in Strasbourg, when we can look at back at the last 50 years of Roma involvement, which we are um, uh, celebrating this year with the Council of Europe and where we can have a World Romani Forum again after 15, 50 years. We had the last one in 1971 in London. Therefore, I'm proposing um, 10 points that we must reach to that time when member states can start spending their monies from the recovery fund and from the European other fundings beginning of November. The specific and targeted indicators of advancements are extremely important. Legal instrument on the comprehensive approach to addressing hate speech, I find it important and doable for us. I think we need a much wider transformative approach to mainstream Roma needs because uh, it's true that uh, with many of the activists in the last 20 years we worked on making people understand that Roma are the same, they need the same rights and they have the same obligations. Therefore, uh, Roma uh, issues may, needs to be mainstreamed. This is how the funds were designed. But now we feel that in many of the cases, Roma are not uh, enough uh, uh, quick or good in lobbying and responding. So many of the, the, the uh, funds are not reaching them uh, and uh, so many other good lobby groups has already been active in, in, the, in the poverty um, um, the, the lowering funds 
and money um, accessing. So the Roma are facing a little bit of backlog, even if it's called the European Roma strategy. So I believe it's important that uh, the Roma, with the new Clisan designed clear targets and binding targets and timelines that the European Commission provided. And thank you very much for all the commissioners who unitedly worked on this. And I think and I hope that you can reunite as a task force, which was in the Commission always for Roma issues among the highest uh, levels of officials and very good um, colleagues. To, to come together again as a task force in the next four or five years and to reflect also with the uh, different um, uh, European Parliament intergroups where there are so many uh, interrelated issues. I think because there are pro uh, elections are coming, we cannot make the same mistakes on the, as in the earlier years. We have to promote the voice and the action of the civil society. We need clear elections everywhere. Roma votes cannot be bought. I think it's also important, as I said, that to promote the best initi in initiatives, but it's not only enough when it comes to governments and big NGOs. It's extremely important to find the small, very good projects in the in the ground. So I hope that not only culturally, uh, but also economic uh, uh, good um, prosperous uh, images can be shown in the media in the next coming years because the role of the media is also extremely important and only media can bring close the everyday little people in the villages who can make the changes, who are really making the changes. So it's important for us politicians to learn from those people. Talking about culture, I think it's important to introduce a European Day for celebration of the Roma cultural heritage. We forget that Roma are a European uh, uh, minority who has contributed hugely culturally, economically to Europe. Europe would not be the same without the Roma in it. And I hope that uh, this, this message will be heard and finally we will have a Roma cultural heritage day. It took us years to be able to celebrate Holocaust, the Puramayos, in dignity. So it's important for us that we can show positive uh, cultural elements and images of the Roma also all around Europe and in the mainstream media. That's very important. But at the same time, we don't have many Roma television stations, radio stations, theaters, uh, film companies. I think it's extremely important that we promote Roma filmmakers, Roma artists to be able to show themselves. Gender mainstreaming, as you introduced me in the mini in the beginning, thank you very much, uh, is is my my one of my most important thing beside the child rights, and um, uh, I would like to uh, propose uh, to to um, with the Council of Europe to follow up uh, on on the Roma task uh, on the Women Task Force in the Council of Europe, and to persuade the member states to promote as many Roma women from the member states as delegates, and not, not only as Roma uh, uh, professionals on Roma issues, but in the general Women Council that is form, being formed now in the European Council of Europe. I think it's important that we reach that from all the 49 member states, there will be Roma women also on the missions. Um, in the Council of Europe on women issues. And um, interestingly enough, the, my last point will be beside proper funding, which I don't have to uh, uh, emphasize as not ever before as much money has been poured into the countries as now. So Roma money cannot be a problem. The money is available. The Roma professionals are there with their knowledge. So uh, I would only in the last bit um, um, talk about the importance of the indicators of the social scoreboard for the European pillar of the social light, because there we need to include Roma integration. And I think this should be uh, my conclusion. I think these should be our goals. And I thank you very much for supporting me in these goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice President Yaroka, for explaining with so much detail uh, the situation of the, in the policy making, but also at the concrete condition of uh, Roma people. You 
uh, spoke about uh, schooling, uh, you spoke about voc vocational uh, training, about employment, and you explained also how much the coronavirus has uh, made even more uh, uh, difficult the situation of, of the people. Uh, I'm thinking about the health uh, situation and also the poor living conditions. You have also, I think, um, uh, put down a roadmap uh, looking at the future of things that could be changed and how these things could be changed. And thank you very much for this, uh, which is uh, a political inspiration for all of us. I move now to uh, our panelists. Uh, we have uh, five people in the panel. We have Mrs. Sonia Pereira, Mrs. Marcia Garcia Figaldo, Mrs. Beata Bislim Olahova, Maria Eronen, and our own IPRS uh, Branislav Stanicek. Let's start with uh, Sonia Pereira. You are both High Commissioner for Migration of Portugal, responsible for Roma Communities Integration Strategy, and President of the Manage Board, Management Board of the High Commission for Migration. You are uh, an economist by training, you have studied uh, migration, and you have a PhD in geography. You have been working with the government of Portugal on also international organizations such as IOM on refugee resettlement and also on ILO, where you specialized on migration dynamics. So we are very much looking forward to your intervention in this panel. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and uh, dear Vice President, dear colleagues, uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here today and thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity uh, to present at this online policy roundtable on behalf of the Portuguese Presidency of the Council of the EU. The Portuguese Presidency uh, is selected as a motto, time to deliver for a fair, green and digital recovery. Uh, and Social Europe uh, uh, was uh, selected also as its main priority. The European Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan was launched during our presidency and we have uh, hosted the Social Summit back in the beginning of May with the aim of giving a clear impulse to turning into action the principles of the European Pillar of Social Rights. This priority stands as a basis for confidence in our social model, also reflecting the focus of the Portuguese presidency with the promotion of equality and non-discrimination in Europe. This also means uh, that uh, we uh, need to engage in active efforts uh, in the fight against racism, the promotion of fundamental rights, the reduction of inequalities and combating all forms of discrimination. Despite the existence of a wide range of legal instruments and policies that promote equality, racial and ethnic discrimination still exists in the EU. And this has been especially felt by uh, Roma communities across the EU. Stepping up efforts to strengthen the equality, inclusion and participation of Roma people in the European Union is more crucial than ever. In a context of growing challenges, posed not only by the COVID-19 pandemic, but also given the rising populism and racism within the Union, leading to an increase in incidence of anti-Gypsism and hate speech. Within these complex and challenging times, it is with great satisfaction that Portugal points to the adoption of the Council recommendation on Roma equality, inclusion and participation on March 12th as one of the main achievements attained during the Portuguese presidency regarding Roma communities in the EU. This recommendation stresses that the European pillar of social rights expresses principles and rights aiming to support and increase social fairness, irrespective of sex, racial or ethnic origin, religion or belief, disability, age or sexual orientation. Concerning different socioeconomic environments and the diversity of national systems and fully respecting the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality. The recommendation also calls on the importance of addressing multiple discrimination, acknowledging that specific needs or vulnerabilities of certain groups within the Roma population, for example, women, young people, children, children, 
pointing out measures to better protect and include Roma children who are particularly exposed to discrimination and segregation. LGBTI, elderly persons with disabilities, those who are third country nationals or stateless, and also EU mobile Roma. During its presidency of the Council of the EU, Portugal also held a conference on Roma equality, inclusion and participation in the EU, working together for Roma rights, and it took place on the uh, 15th of April. We organized this conference with the General Secretariat of the Council, and it aimed at uh, step up, uh, stepping up efforts to reinforce Roma equality, inclusion and participation in the EU, against the background of increasing challenges in the context of COVID-19 pandemic, as well as incidents of anti-Gypsism and hate speech that have been observed in different countries in the EU. EU Roma, uh, in, in concrete, the, the EU Roma Strategic Framework for Equality, Inclusion and Participation for 2020-2030 a 10-year plan to support Roma people in the EU is consistent with other EU policies, particularly with the Racial Equality Directive, the European Pillar of Social Rights, and the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU, which prohibit discrimination based on ethnic or racial origin. The relevance of this strategic framework relies on the persistence of problems in the living conditions of Roma people that require continued targeted action, making it necessary to keep developing specific intervention at different levels, namely concerning housing, employment and prevention of school dropout. This strategic framework is robust and structured on an intersectional approach, providing continuity with the previous framework. Setting out a comprehensive three-pillar approach, around equality, inclusion and participation and four sectoral objectives on education, employment, health and housing. It contains the necessary developments for a comprehensive and cohesive policy response to the needs that they identified for the inclusion of Roma communities. It should also be pointed out that this strategic framework is designed to prevent and combat discrimination and as such should be present in all sectoral interventions to ensure the fight against anti-Gypsism and hate speech. In this regard, and as an example, reaching targets such as doubling the percentage of Roma who makes a formal complaint in case of discrimination will require changes in the framework of consequences associated with such acts, as well as to combat online hate speech, which is to be welcome. Partnerships and institutional capacity are the operational part of this strategic framework with the dense content of proposed recommendations and measures. It is to be noted uh, the promotion of multi-level cooperation between local, regional, as well as the recommendations regarding inclusion, diversity, and the recognition <coughs> of the representativeness of Roma women, as well as men at the local level. The fact that this strategic framework as a set of common and minimum elements that all national strategies of the member states should contemplate promotes a concerted action at the European level, while the definition of specific indicators arising from the national context ensures the adequacy of the responses to the reality and specificity of each country's situation. It is also important to highlight the timelines uh, and uh, pertinence of the use of the portfolio of quantitative indicators. Such indicators facilitate the process of design, monitoring and reporting the implementation of the national strategies over the defined period of time. The fulfillment of this strategic framework requires the involvement and partnership with Roma communities in a multi-level, multi-sectoral approach, integrating the various stakeholders. Only by doing so, we aim to achieve within the 10 years of the framework, the equality, inclusion and participation of Roma people that it envisions. I would like to finish by providing uh, some uh, uh, data on the Portuguese experience. We have a national Roma communities integration strategy 
uh, which is coordinated by the High Commission for Migration, uh, a public institution uh, under the direct dependency of the Presidency of the Council of Ministers. Within this strategy, there is an advisory group for Roma communities, a board that plays an important role on improving the implementation of the strategy, its monitoring and evaluation, as well as monitoring Roma community situation. It is chaired by the High Commission and is composed of representatives from, among others, the government areas of integration, equality and citizenship, education, health, housing, youth, employment, social security, local authorities and other institutions working with Roma people, associations that represent Roma persons as well as police forces. Portugal is firmly committed to the implementation of its national Roma communities integration strategy and will continue to follow a multi-level and multi-sectoral approach towards Roma inclusion and to the realization of the EU Roma strategic framework for equality, inclusion and participation for the period 2020-2030. Finally, and as presidency, we would like to reiterate the, that achieving a Europe where no one is left behind recalls a shared political commitment and responsibility. The Portuguese presidency is proud to have put equality at the heart of its action and invites all future presidencies to follow the path of promoting inclusion and participation towards a fairer and inclusive Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's turn now to uh, the next speaker with uh, Marta Garcia Fidalgo. Uh, Mrs. Garcia Fidalgo works in the European Commission where she's advisor uh, for the coordination of Roma policies and equality coordinator at the European Commission's Director General for European Neighbourhood Policy and Enlargement Negotiation, the so-called DG NIR. Um, she has been working 30 years in the Commission, 20 of which have been primarily focused on enlargement negotiations and the respect of fundamental rights. As the head of the unit for Albania and Montenegro, she led the team that prepared the Commission's opinion on membership applications for both countries, including benchmarks for starting negotiations on the Roma. She subsequently chaired all screening meetings for Montenegro and Serbia in the areas of the rule of law. So we are very much looking forward to uh, your presentation. Thank you very much um, and thank you very much for inviting me to this seminar. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to have the possibility to, to share with you the um, Western Balkans dimension of the new strategy. But before I'm talking about this Western Balkan uh, dimension, allow me to go a little bit back on some background. As uh, Vice President Jaroka has done for Member State, I would like to give you some figures concerning Western Balkan Roma uh, community. Based on the Council of Europe large report about the size of the Roma population in its member, uh, the percentage of population Roma population in, in the Western Balkan countries goes from 1 plus 6 percent for Bosnia-Herzegovina to up to 9.6 for North Macedonia. And if we talk about the historic evolution, what has happened with the Western Balkans in this uh, Roma inclusion history? I have to say that the first strategy, the 2010-2020 strategy, already uh, make a reference to the enlargement region, even if it was not very ambitious. We put three um, mandate of three objectives, is to improve the inclusion of Roma the, um, in the use of EU uh, funds, what is, we call IPA funds, to strengthen the involvement uh, with the civil society in Roma policy, and to closely monitor progress on Roma integration. What is important to note is that um, the Western Balkan region voluntarily went 
well beyond these three objectives, and it has also made remarkable advances. And trying to mirror um, as much as possible the evolution of the policy for member states. The Western Balkan countries has adopted Roma strategies and the related action plans. It has involved uh, the civil society, depending on the countries more or less. It has established the network of the national Roma contact points that exist for member states, and it has also organized national platforms. But uh, now let's, let's move to the objective of, of today's event. Who is uh, the what? How is the Western Balkan represented in the 2020 Equip strategy? And what is the approach follow and the mandate regarding the Western Balkans? First, the reference to Western Balkans you will find in the chapter five of the strategy, a chapter that is related to promoting Roma equality, inclusion, and participation beyond the EU. As regards the uh, Western Balkans, there are important novelties. The first one is that it says, I'm, I'm now quoting the text, the EU and the member state should promote Roma equality, inclusion and participation in its external action. In particular, uh, it makes a, a, a series of reference to enlargement. I would like to raise your attention that when using the terminology EU, it's talking about all institutions. It's not only about the Commission, it's not only about the Council, but also the European Parliament. So I think we are all in the same in the same boat. The second element is that it requires to have a progressive alignment with the EU objective and methodology as part of the European perspective. So definitely, I think, um, as uh, Vice President Jaroka mentioned, the new ambitious strategy includes very important elements that also, as, as mentioned, this methodology should progressively be followed but, uh, by the Western Balkan countries. And I think there is also a very important novelty in the enlargement work for the first time uh, in all the accessions, and as said by Mr. Basot, I'm working on accessions in um, 2000, I think already for 20 years. Um, in, in, in this area, the, um, for the first time, Roma inclusion is in the negotiation proper. Now, as you know, one of the super chapters are chapter 23, and 24. And in one of the super chapter, chapter 23, uh, related to the judiciary and fundamental right, there are key elements um, related to what progress is needed by accession of Roma integration. And that gives us um, a strong um, enlargement benefit tool. And I can say that it also gives a possibility of monitoring because in the every six month uh, non papers, there is a paragraph related to how um, Roma inclusion is progressing. Another important element introduced by the new strategy, and again, is learning for the successful tools in member states, is for the first time, is including the reference that the Western Balkan uh, region should mirror. Um, the exercise that member states does in the European semester. And you know that the European semester recommendation for some member states on Roma inclusion has been essential. Now, um, the Western Balkan has a similar exercise, what we call annual economic report programs. And now the mandate is also to include, when relevant, um, Roma recommendations. Also, I think it is important to, to mention that um, not in the chapter five about the external relation, but in the body of the strategy related to member states, it includes a very important duty of member states to also support the socioeconomic integration of third country nationals. 
And when we are talking about third country nationals, the Western Balkan nationals are an important community. And not only uh, Western Balkan nationals, but also uh, Western Balkans people that has no, no, uh, no nationality. Why? Because there is a reality. When Yugoslav um, entered into war, there was a movement of citizens, including Roma population, that now do not have a country of origin. So it's impossible for them to address to any consulate to have uh, really papers or being able to benefit or try to um, request and work with the country of origin on their return. So I think this new um, rule is extremely important for the Western Balkans. Finally, this um, chapter um, on uh, five on external relation includes a reference on IPA3 and the need that the instrumental of prioritization assistance on IPA3 are also used for uh, Roma inclusion. I know that IPA3 regulation is not yet adopted. I think that you, the European Parliament has tomorrow a trialogue on, on this, this issue. But um, as you know, IPA3 now is moving from uh, the country envelopes to the priorities envelope. And I can tell you that Roma inclusions is part of uh, the priority one. There are five priorities, one related to rule of law, and is in this area where we are at. Uh, Allow me to um, touch still on three points before uh, my concluding remarks. And I would like to share with you other key recent instruments that has been adopted that uh, are very important to support Roma inclusion in the Western Balkans. The first, uh, Mr. Basot say, is the Poznan Declaration. And I think this Poznan Declaration really is extremely important. The Pona Declaration that was adopted in the July 2019 under the framework of the Berlin process anticipated already the US strategy target, numeric target objectives. Already in 2019, it was um, established in this Poznan Declaration complete targets that need to be fulfilled again by accession. And in order not to have a discussion about how we increase, we establish also a baseline, a common baseline. So we have done a survey a 20, uh, that finalized in 2017 in the Western Balkan. And using this survey in the Poznan Declaration, Western Balkan um, head of the state had agreed to increase employment from 60% actually to 25% have a compulsory education, not as now, a completing compulsory education, not as now 51%, but 90% of uh, Roma students to get a health insurance for up to 25% of, of Roma, and also to map and legalize informal settlements um, through housing legalization. And this again is also a very important objective. The element on anti-discrimination anti discrimination was also included, as well as the promotion of the role of the non uh, the equality bodies. What I would like also to mention, what is very important of the Poznan Declaration, is that it has a law to put Roma inclusion matter in the highest political radar. As you know, on annual um, summits, Berlin summit, we have a point of the agenda on Roma inclusion, analyzing the last year progress and setting new objectives for the next year. And uh, this uh, has created a dynamic that the minister responsible for Roma inclusion in all the Western Balkans meets once a year to really uh, prepare these uh, summit conclusions. The next meeting will, uh, will take place at the end, 28th of June, to prepare the 6th uh, of, of July summit in Berlin. And not only the minister prepared the summit, but the conclusion of the summits include only always the Roma paragraph and are adopted by head of a state 
of Western Balkans and member states. So I think this is a, a, a really fantastic uh, tool to get political attention, who you all know is not always um, easy to get. The second important element adopted is the 2020 communication on economic and investment plan for Western Balkans. And I have to say that in this communication, and it was a personal contribution of Commissioner Vaheli, in this communication, uh, they introduced uh, with high priority the work related to human capital and, and notably the support to marginalized groups and minorities. And Commissioner uh, um, Barrelli insists to have in this communication explicitly and not exclusively making a reference to Roma. The last um, uh, element is, as I mentioned, uh, the IPA, IPA, IPA 3 work. And now uh, allow me my closing um, remarks to deviate a little bit for the um, theme of this event, but to share with you some things that is close to my heart. I think that what will be very helpful, at least from the Western Bankers' point of view, is that the European Parliament reinforce the empowerment and the participation of Roma MPs in the Western Balkan. And they have a very important role to do. And not only when we are talking about legislation, new legislation that are relevant, but also in all of the power they find of government control control of the government policies. For me, that will be a tool that absolutely needs to be used more as regards the implementation of the new strategies. I usually have, uh, when I go to the countries, uh, meetings with the uh, MPs, the Roma MPs in the, in the different parliaments, and I see that there is an untapped potential or role to play. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Garcia uh, Fidalgo. Uh, turn now to our next speaker with uh, Beata Bislim Olahova. She is advisor on Roma and Sinti issues at the ODIE, which is the OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. Uh, Mrs. Olahova has been working internationally for more than 15 years, providing policy advice grounded in successful Roma integration models to governmental institutions throughout Europe. And before joining the OSC in 2019, she was a member of the management board of the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights. Over to you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Olahova. Thank you very much, uh, dear Vice President, dear moderator, dear colleagues and uh, dear participants. Uh, thank you for organizing this important meeting and thank you for inviting the OSCE's Office uh, for uh, Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. I will introduce today part of our work uh, at the contact point for Roma and Sinti issues, uh, looking at last year's human dimension commitments of the OSC participating states. And I will also touch upon the uh, political uh, participation of uh, the Roma and Sinti in the OSC region as uh, the result of uh, the third status report uh, that has been published in 2018. I'm going to share my presentation um, to share with you some uh, visuals. Um, okay. And um, uh, basically, um, for those uh, who might not be so familiar, uh, the OSC um, contact point for Roma and Sinti issues um, is uh, based in Warsaw, and um, and uh, the the uh, main um, role of the OSC as a contact point is to review the implementation and uh, the progress of the OSC key policy instruments uh, for promoting Roma and Sinti inclusion, and that is the 2003 action plan on improving the situation of Roma and Sinti in the OSC area, as well the three uh, consecutive OSC ministerial council decisions from 2008, uh, 2009, and uh, 2013. 
the action plan uh, it's a political commitment um, and um, it sets uh, um, a comprehensive um, um, num number of comprehensive commitments uh, and actions um, uh, set by the participating state the 57 OSC member states uh, uh, with the main uh, umbrella to combat racism and discrimination and to promote equal access to opportunities uh, in education, employment, housing, health services, and many others, including political participation for Roma and Sinti as such. Um, I will look at, uh, uh, I will share with you a little bit of overview for the last year. So, um, as we know, uh, uh, 2020 was a difficult year um, and many participating states have uh, imposed uh, various uh, emergency uh, measures uh, and restrictions uh, of uh, the movement for people, um, including social distancing. Lockdowns um, have had a heavier impact on the daily life uh, of the marginalized and socially excluded Roma communities because a number of quarantine measures were imposed, even when there was uh, little evidence um, that uh, the, the community uh, had been affected by the coronavirus uh, infections. Uh, despite of that, many of the um, communities were locked down and, um, and people had no access uh, to, to basic services and, uh, to, and, and going out uh, to search uh, for economic opportunities. Um, beyond this, um, there has been also increased number of unjustified and uh, disproportionate use of force uh, and abuse uh, by law enforcement um, agencies and the police, uh, as reported by many organizations and the media. Uh, the pandemic also added another new layer of complexity uh, to states forced to address discrimination and hate crimes across the OSC region and uh, prompted a surge in racist discourse and scapegoating and racial, uh, racialized uh, uh, minorities of racialized minorities. Um, last year, we conducted a media monitoring in uh, 10 uh, participating states. Um, where we reviewed how the Roma are portrayed uh, during the uh, pandemics. And um, the data revealed that 33% um, of the news stories uh, were inciting hateful uh, uh, rhetoric um, and were directly categorized as hate speech. 21% 20, uh, of the news reported on incidents that involved Roma communities in the participating states uh, dis uh, displaying Roma as uh, the rule breakers and um, other negative characteristics. Um, Odir, uh, Odir uh, also published an annual hate crime uh, report and uh, the data in uh, uh, the um, hate crime report uh, specifically on Roma um, revealed that uh, that Roma were target of uh, of uh, various attacks, um, physical attacks, property damage, uh, murder involving use of explosive firearms, arson attacks, and uh, other. Uh, the number of hate crime inputs by organizations to audit increased by 43 percent compared to previous year. Uh, all these findings uh, can be found um, in our publications. Uh, these are very useful uh, um, information because they contain all the human dimension commitments and the review how the state responded uh, to the pandemic in, uh, um, in various participating states. However, it also uh, contains handful of recommendations how uh, to address uh, this situation in uh, the participating states, and it has also a specific chapter on Roma and Sinti. Also, the annual report of the OSE, on, um, which is out now uh, and can be found, uh, has, uh, has uh, a number of recommendations and also, also displays the activities that have been carried out last year uh, by OSE. 
Moving now to the topic that was touched also by the previous speakers and uh, which is very important um, for the Roma, uh, particularly it is the participation in public and political life. The OSC action plan, uh, specifically chapter six, uh, and the subsequent relevant ministerial council decisions uh, place a particular emphasis on the importance of participation of Roma and Sinti in public and political life and in all policy processes that are affecting them. Uh, participation can be, of course, an effective tool also to counter racism and discrimination towards changing the attitude and perception of ma majority population towards Roma and Sinti. Um, the third status report, which um, was published uh, in 2018, entitled uh, Forum with Roma, reviewed the implementation of uh, the human of the human dimension commitments related to enhancing participation in public and political life. And 39 of the 57 participating states uh, replied to their questionnaire. And uh, the findings are following uh, the um, um, only few participating states actually reported that there has been an increase uh, in the number of Roma and Sinti candidates in the elections in the last five years during uh, uh, the review uh, process. And uh, factors that uh, impeded uh, participation of Roma and Sinti candidates in elections included low interest among mainstream political parties, in, including national minorities, um, reluctance to include and promote Roma and Sinti candidates on their list. As well, financial limited resources for campaigning, especially for Roma and Sinti women candidates. It's also difficult to identify trends uh, because most of the participating states reported that they do not collect data uh, disaggregated by the ethnicity. Um, as well, uh, several governmental uh, structures uh, did not have uh, specifically institutions uh, addressing Roma and Sinti. Um, we had three uh, Roma and Sinti participating in the European Parliament. Um, and we had a um, number of um, Roma elected in national parliament, which were nine to five. You can see this number is pretty low um, because uh, we speak about 57 OSC participating states. Uh, so um, there are a lot of remaining challenges that needs to be addressed and uh, should be reflected in, um, in, um, in uh, the, the priorities among the many of the political parties. I mean, it's fascinating research that you are presenting here. Uh and especially all these statistics on the surveys in the participation of, pub of public life. And uh, we would certainly, not only in DPRS, but I think the, uh, the, the audience, uh, be very interested to, to, if you could share these slides, because uh, for, for research and for, uh, for also for policy making, they are really, really very interesting. So, uh, but please continue if, if you like and, and finish, and then we will move to the next. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, if it's all right for you, otherwise, yeah. Um, uh, yes, I, I perhaps should also add that um, um, the, the participation of Roma women, uh, um, it's also a very important factor, which has been uh, largely, um, largely ignored by many of the political parties, and there is lack of um, candidates among Roma women um, uh, for running for positions. I, um, I, I would like to share more with you, but uh, my voice does not allow me. I really apologize. Thanks for this very, very rich uh, presentation. Um, uh, that brings me also to, to recall to the, to the participants that uh, they can use the, the the Q&A uh, opportunity and the chat function to, to, to share their thoughts and to bring their, their questions. And we will try to bring them, if time is permitting, at the end in the discussion.
So it's open. I'm already receiving some, some very interesting points that are made by, by the audience. I move now to uh, our two last speakers, Maria Eronen first. Uh, Maria Eronen is coming from, uh, she's in Finland. She is a coordinator of the International Romani Union since 2020, following a long and accomplished career as a scientific advisor and ombudsperson. As a trained sociologist, uh, she uh, has authored numerous scientific publications on medical sociology and disability since the 70s. I don't go into the detail, but she also conducted a survey on educational needs for the Roma population uh, that are published uh, in Finland. And in her spare time, I understand that she also enjoys music and time with her grandchildren. So over to you, uh, please, uh, Maria. About the socioeconomic states in European and Balkan Roma. And uh, I want to say something. I'm head of the commissariat in IRO nowadays. Uh, the next two, thank you. Um, um, I think that um, in uh, all Roma has uh, now this um, this hope. Uh, it's all urgent that get concrete targeted measures, and um, um, all all people has um, has this. Uh, purpose in their life. They they want um, they have to be hope, honor, self esteem, self pride. All, also in Roma, in Ro all Roma hope this. As we have before um, heard, uh, eighty percent of European Roma are poor, uh, um, and also in Balkan we don't know numbers, but uh, there is, I think there is much more. And um, that's why I think that uh, we have to be a good anti-poverty strategy. This is a Roma strategy too. Uh, and what every uh, poor Roma family wants is to see concrete changes in their uh, daily life. Life, not only speaks uh, speaking, uh, but uh, something concrete. Um, and that's why we need financial and other support. And um, I like, um, I'm a researcher, uh, I, I, in my background, I, I like the European Eurostat indicators. I think that we should um, use more these indicators. And then three, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, salty, I can say, say this. It's a, a little time. Uh, full human rights for all Roma. That's our purpose. Purpose. Um, and we have in IRU um, a strategy of European Roma guarantee. And it includes um, education, employment, health, and housing, and um, and it includes also independent body and contact point Roma Ombudsman. Um, um, I think we can take number four. Education. Um, of course, um, have to be, um, first of all, in the schools have to be multi, multi and interculturalism. Um, and uh, preventing exclusion and early school leaving. Uh, well, we have heard this today before. Inclusion, not isol isolation. Preschool, uh, primary, secondary school, and also higher education. Um, um, Roma, um, I have some ideas. Uh, we should have. Um, Roma, Roma school mediators, school support services, uh, for example, assistance um, in the schools. And um, who cannot read and write, they, they need uh, courses, of course, uh, mostly 
more, more, more Roma women. And um, in Roma family needs mobile phones and computers. And uh, what I am thinking in the schools, we have to be zero tolerance for school bullying um, in, social, in social media too. We have in Finland this kind of good um, project, Kiva Koulu. It helps uh, um, against bullying. And um, all textbooks should be without discrimination. Um, um, training of child rights and human rights, so, uh, civil society skills, like democracy and equality should um, be in the schools. And of course, the education for all Romani ex experts. And we have talented Roma young people. Uh, for they, they could um, want, maybe they want uh, to become researchers. Uh, and Romani uh, as mother language, uh, as mother tongue, should uh, teach in the schools. We have in Finland uh, two hours uh, per week this kind of, 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 of trainings. Also textbooks, uh, textbooks should be in our, in our language. Yeah, and uh, awareness campaigns, and then five. Thank you. Employment. Um, uh, Marginalized Roma earns the small salaries with precarious job, recycling, seasonal agricultural workers, and so on. And the situation is uh, now re really difficult. What what is solution to this? Um, to this, uh, for example, minimum income. Employment, unemployment, employment, uh, security for all Roma. The training for the formal economy needs, culture tops, uh, festivals, music, film, theater, art, um, unknown requirements, requirements, quotas, state and municipal uh, employment subsidies and media campaigns, of course. Uh, we have in our uh, initiative Roma Business Incubator. Um, and uh, number six, thank you. Health. Uh, oh, uh, there is two, two. I, I, can, uh, I can talk fastly. Health. Uh, short life expectancy is uh, the problem, uh, 48, uh, 50 years only. Causes, for example, um, um, unhygienic and non-standard living conditions, the lack of drinking water, uh, the lack of uh, sewage, electricity, Hygiene treatment is difficult, no mask, no hand, uh, uh, hand hygiene, and corona vaccines uh, are missing. This is the big problem. Every Roma should uh, get corona vaccines, uh, and they are working um, in hard physical works. This is the problem. Uh, and. I think one, one problem is that uh, they are collection secondary raw materials. Um, uh, there, there is poisons too. I think uh, that uh, this is the problem, one problem too. Um, of course, they have no insurance uh, uh, in health. And uh, we have heard before that uh, there is lack of birth and identity cards too. This is the big problem too. Maybe the number is not so no, big, but uh, the problem is uh, large, I think. 
and Roma women has own problem uh, about abortions, uh, early pregnancies, early marriages, partner violence. And then seven, thank you. Um, maybe shortly. Um, um, is, oh, maybe maybe the, the next, the last. Housing. Um, we have heard uh, about this um, Roma settlement scams and ghettos before. Isolation also from suburbs. Uh, uh, we need adequate housing and I think there should be water, electricity, uh, sewage, normal for, and internet connection should also be there. And we know uh, we need state financial support uh, uh, so that uh, we can build uh, um, good rental house houses. And of oh, oh course, uh, European Commission's uh, um, financial support is important too. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Eronen, and uh, thank you also for sharing the uh, the slides, if it's possible, afterwards, so that we can uh, we can uh, disclose it with the participant. And we come to our last uh, speaker, which I will ask to to speak briefly to save a little bit of time for the uh, the Q and A afterwards. It's our own uh, expert in the EPRS, uh, Branislav Stanisek. We uh, who also prepared uh, this event so successfully, and I'd like to thank him for this uh, very, uh, uh, very successful uh, preparation. He's policy analyst in our external policies unit in the EPRS, and he has had uh, formerly several positions that are relevant to uh, this discussion today, including uh, his um, uh, participation uh, to the cabinet of Jan Fidel, special envoy for the promotion of freedom of religion or belief outside of the European Union, and uh, also the position in the Committee of the Region, where he worked for the Committee on uh, Foreign Affairs, which is uh, where he was following uh, the question of the Western Balkans. And uh, prior to all this, he has been a fellow at the Foundation for Political Innovation in Paris. So over to you, uh, Branislav. So thank you, Etienne. Also, thank you to excellent panelists, especially to our Vice President, Mrs. Yaroka. She is uh, for us inspiring figure, and also it is an honor to have her as the first Roma MEP here in the Parliament and in this panel. So I will make a very brief, very short presentation that is complementary to what was already said in three parts. The first one is the importance of good indicators second is political participation and the third part role of uh, central european countries and sharing of best practices with the western balkans so uh, as, as you know the indicators are crucial in the new strategy in the new framework but uh, we can see that in several countries the collection of data is very, very difficult and also complicated not only in eu member states also in the western balkans uh, in my country, Slovakia, we prepared what we called Atlas of Roma Communities. It was initiative started by former Prime Minister Iveta Radičova already in 2004. Up today, we have uh, three editions, and the last one is prepared by former Special Envoy for Roma Community, Abel Ravas. So this is probably a very good tool. We have there over 50 indicators that present the stratification of Roma community, linguistic, social, economic, and other indicators. Then uh, the second point is political participation. It was stressed by Marta, also by Beata and Livia. So uh, we have in Slovakia over 40 mayors that are of Roma nationalities and they are doing excellent work also we know in Hungary people like Istvan Serto Radic good friend of mine 
So he's also doing excellent work. And here we have to stress that this link or a kind of transmission of responsibilities from European Parliament, national governments and local communities. This is very important to underline also in accession countries. And now on accession countries, so we know that uh, it was already said, but it's really important that Roma integration was put at the heart of accession negotiations. So the Commission of Arheli presented a new methodology last February, and in the cluster one fundamentals, we have all this agenda. What is important is the point that this first cluster is open at the, as the first place and is closed at the end of negotiations. So we have certainty that this agenda will never be overlooked and will be really fulfilled. So this is in this very short period what I would like to say and I put back the microphone to Etienne. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Branislav, for highlighting these uh, very important points. We come to the end of uh, the presentations by the panelists. I have now uh, four questions that I received from the audience, and I'm going to uh, to explain the four questions uh, one by one. But then uh, I will ask uh, the participants to uh, the panel to, to 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 respond then globally. Um, First question is uh, on the statistics on Roma populations. Um, uh, it says that um, the statistics are not always very precise. What could be done to improve this data in EU27 and accessing countries? And that could be a question for Mrs. Garcia Figaldo uh, from the Commission. Could be also possibly a question for Odia. A second question that I think is for uh, Vice President Yaroka is about participation in public life. Um, a question for Mathilde. Uh, what can we do to encourage participation in political life for Roma people? Um, and then I have another question from uh, a person named Raquel, and she's a student uh, uh, studying Roma rights activists. Uh, and then she putting the following question. Uh, I am an AMA student uh, studying uh, Roma rights activists utilizing online platforms, and I'm wondering the following. What do the practical applications of programs promoting anti-hate speech and crimes against the Roma look like? So how much, if I can say, do we take advantage of the digital transformation to promote an agenda against hate speech? I think this question could be uh, for, for several of the speakers here. And finally, I have a testimony of uh, Mrs. Ann, and she's uh, running a business in uh, Romania uh, that employs eight Roma people. And she says that my major goal is to provide employment for as many unemployed Roma as possible. What assistance could the EU offer to someone like me in the private sector who wants to offer employment to Roma? By the way, she says, I have found my employees to be excellent, superb employees, more dedicated than uh, so many other people that I have known in my work experience. So a very uh, positive message from uh, Anne from Romania. So first question on, on statistics, possibly for Mrs. Garcia Figaldo, then to Vice President uh, Yaroka, I would say participation in public, public life, how we can encourage it, then um, uh, how we can take advantage of the uh, online platforms to fight against hate speech and finally uh, businesses that are employing um, uh, Roma people, how we can promote and help these ones. So maybe first uh, to Mrs. Yaroka, uh, our Vice President, uh, participation to public life and the way to encourage uh, uh, Roma people to become politicians and participate to, uh, to uh, institutions. We can't hear you anymore, I'm sorry. Would you maybe try removing the headset? It's 
still not. I'm sorry. We can't see. We can't hear you. Maybe unplug unplug the headset, and sometimes it's uh, it's helping. We all encounter these type of problems nowadays with these online events. Uh, this is just happening. So maybe we do we do the following. We uh, we we wait a little bit uh, until uh, uh, Mrs. Yaroka has found uh, the voice again. Uh, and then uh, we maybe look at this question of uh, of statistics uh, with um, uh, the representative from the Commission, Mrs. Garcia Figaldo. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. The first point I would like to present is I fully agree what what he has been said that data is essential, essential for. Um, solid policy decision, but also essential to measure uh, real progress or lack of progress. For me, it's clear, no data, no possibility to see whether there is progress or not. And if we don't have numeric factual data, we uh, fall in the trap like improve. What, what does it mean improve? Improve education is to have two um, uh, two more students, or is about the percentage. So I, I think that uh, is uh, an essential element. Um, concerning the Western Balkans, uh, as regards the Western Balkans, we have done two surveys, um, financed by IPAFANS. Now our real objective is to be sure that the Fundamental Rights Agency covered in the regular survey related to Roma in Crucio, also uh, enlargement countries. Until now, I think there are three enlargement countries that are uh, observers. Uh, they pay quite an important fee that is uh, covered by IPA funds. And as observers uh, are going to be for the first time in the new, um, uh, in the new uh, um, analysis to be covered. However, uh, as regards the other three that are not uh, part of of as observers and are not paying the, the interest fee and that's one of the of the reasons i think it's important that they cover two because they are meant to be enlargement countries they are meant to fulfill a certain number of progress upon accession so that will help us to monitor without having really to to finance independent uh, independent surveys, being 100% sure that we use the same uh, methodology and be sure that the data from, of the fundamental rights agency can be used for comparability in the post-accession phase. So that will be my, my comment on that. Right, thank you very much. Does anyone want to comment on the hate speech online and how much digital transformation and uh, online uh, platforms can can help to fight against uh, hate speech. Yes, Mrs. Eronen, Maria, please. Yeah. Uh, I think that it should be um, sanctions in in the law, so that uh, um, they can they um, they get some some uh, some something so that, so that uh, everything can cannot go on. They have to stop. They have to stop. They have to be sanctions. Thank you, Thank you. for that contribution. So the importance of uh, of uh, the legal ways uh, establishing sanctions to be able to 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 fight against it. Many thanks for that uh, that contribution. Uh, then there was this uh, this lady from Romania uh, explaining that she has been very successful in uh, employing in her business uh, Roma people and. Um, and if anyone wants to comment on that particular uh, aspect and how much we can promote this in the future, if it's not uh, if it's not the case, then I would uh, I would hand. Oh yes, please, uh, Mrs. Garcia. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I I would like to con uh, congratulate to the person that has uh, explained us her situation. I think uh, in, in our analysis, uh, Roma employment increase on Roma employment need to go 
first and most through private sector. We have been working in, in, in the past about quotas in the public sector, and let's be realistic, most of the employment is on the private sector. Um, so I think this private sector needs to be supported, uh, and the taking of Roma in this private sector, I can give three examples of what we are doing. Uh, we have had IPA projects that support uh, uh, private uh, um, projects that has as one of the conditionality to have Roma people engage. We have um, also, and, and it's this year, you know that every two years now for the fifth time, we give Indigenian and Roma award. And the theme of this 21 Roma award is to um, put into value that uh, public or private um, enterprises that has done a special effort on engaging Roma. So that will be a, a, another way from our side to really, um, to really support us. And the third uh, thing that we are doing is we consider that one of the more uh, potential areas for employment of Roma is the self-employment especially moving for grey economy to uh, to really uh, economy the existing normal economy and as we have realized uh, that they have problems to get to financing for the safe employ employment we have an ipa project that is going to start implementation in the first semester of the year where we are supporting through an organization that already exists ready to give financing to um, Roma, to facilitate access to financing to Roma employment. And I have uh, that what is very important is that we are helping to set up the uh, capacity and we are working in cooperation with the Council of Europe Bank that are going to feed with the necessary funds. So that will be my three examples, but thank you again, unless a work to support this private employment of Roma. Thank you very much. I turn again to uh, Mrs. Yaroka. If you have uh, any comments, it's still not working. So we have an issue of connections here. Uh, uh, we're sorry for that. And Cecilia, is there anything we can do from the center? Yeah, maybe just try to disconnect and reconnect. Normally, it should re enable everything. Disconnect from the event. Okay. Yes, unfortunately. Yes, that gives us two minutes for, for Maria. I, th I saw that she was raising her hand. So please, uh, Mrs. Eronen, uh, you can share with us uh, your comments on this yes. question of private sector. I, I think that we, we should have a, a quota so that there is a, a certain percent or certain number. So that, that um, uh, some uh, some um, some firma or or uh, business um, or government uh, or official sector have to get, um, get um, some Roma to their employers. I think quota is good resolution. Thank you. Thank you. The question of uh, quota. So we wait two minutes until Mrs. Yaroka joins us back again. Maybe I can just. Uh, yes, Mrs. Pereira, please take advantage. Uh, it's just a, a brief comment just to mention that um, we have a, an observatory for my uh, Roma communities also part of the High Commission for Migration. And uh, this year, for the second time, this uh, observatory is awarding a recognition to private firms that employ five or more people from Roma communities. So it, it is also a way of providing an incentive and encouraging um, in, uh, firms uh, to come forward and also serve as examples for, for other private companies. Um, so this is something that's on, ongoing. Uh, last year was the first edition. The, the award is um, handed in by the Secretary of State 
for integration uh, and migration. And so maybe this also this is also a small initiative that can contribute uh, to provide to promote employment of Roma people within private companies. Thank you. This is a, a program in Portugal. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, we just had a, a further question in your absence. So if you like to share with us what uh, are your thoughts about uh, political participation for Roma people, participation institutions, and also more generally, if you have any concluding remarks that uh, you like to make, over to you. And especially women, and especially women, because we have a lot of Roma leader men, uh, and a lot of them um, uh, have difficulties to accept Roma women leadership. So there is still a long way to go. But uh, in the last uh, 10 years, we had in our, my office about 100, 100 young Roma university students who became leaders, researchers, um, activists, grassroots workers. So it worked very well. And a long time ago, many of the countries has already um, uh, introduced special scholarship programs. And now they seem to be working out, except that <coughs> Thanks to the Commission, we had many stagiaires there as well, except that we need much more. And in all levels of the political leadership ladder in Brussels, they need to learn Brussels. So it's important that the Brussels-based um, uh, NGOs help uh, these students to have time in, in, in Brussels. And it's an interesting question when it comes to leadership, who is to lead? As for example, in Hungary, it's not, I'm not only a Roma women leader and a, 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 a little bit younger one than the man uh, in my generation, but I'm also um, um, uh, a Romungrica, an other Roma group. I'm not a Vlach Romani woman. Therefore, for the Vlach man, it's extremely difficult to listen to me. While among the musician Roma, where I come from, this woman role model is unknown. Uh, Roma women musician wives are staying at home with the children. So it's not only about uh, political leadership uh, from outside, letting the gajos, the Roma participate, but it's also the Roma letting the other Roma participate. And the most important factor in this is the youth coming in. And not uh, youth, I only mean by university, patriarchy education, but at the very young age, at the vocational training, and already in the elementary upper classes to learn their rights and their um, obligations. And for that, I introduced uh, to the Hungarian law several years ago, a compulsory work under vocational training time. You don't get your diploma un unless you went to be a volunteer. And that's what I learned that was a, a useful program, because in this one, Roma, non-Roma kids were working together to help building leadership for those who were in, in diverse situations. Now in Hungary, we have 350 Roma university students, and we are trying to organize ourselves politically as, as well as, as, um, as people for, with uh, um, with degrees, but uh, uh, when you asked about data, if you allow me just to, for one minute to come back and to the question is who is Roma, who is not, how shall we keep um, 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 the record of, of even ethnicity, but desegregated data is so needed and so possible tool for us to have. And uh, uh, but the question is who is Roma and who is not when it comes to um, um, uh, the peaceful living together of the Roma and the non-Roma in the longer term, uh, uh, I, I can see that the Commission is, is very uh, pushing to have a sort of uh, um, reconciliation uh, uh, gesture, which is extremely important, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, without data, not knowing how many Roma we have, is uh, quite problematic because I'm always uh, told that, oh, there are only six million Roma. But just let me tell you my story, my PhD begins like this, that when the censor uh, person who, 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 who um, um, looks into every single household and counts the people came to my house, uh, my mom is non-Roma and my dad is Roma. 
So I was washing up in the kitchen and my mom opened the door and the guy came in and he said, okay, let me count you. How many Roma you have in the house? Uh, none, because my mom was uh, blonde. And then I came out of the kitchen, I shouted out and I said, wait, wait, we are not five non-Roma. We are, uh, my mom is non-Roma and the rest. And then he, he looked at me, he was shocked. And he said, oh, come on, don't worry. You guys look blonde. We just take you as non-Roma, okay? But that time I was already a CEU, Roma activist. So I said, no, 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 I'm Roma. And then my mom was shocked uh, because she thought I'm a mixed. So I will say I'm mixed, but there was no uh, uh, um, possibility to say mixed. You were either Gajo or you were Roma. And under the Roma, there were different names, Vlachiko Roma, uh, uh, Umbrico Roma. So none of them fitted in me. And then the bigger question came that what will be my brother and my sister? If I call myself Gypsy, they don't want to call themselves Gypsy. Okay, my dad is Gypsy. So she, she started to tick the boxes saying that I'm a Roma. My father is a Roma. My mother is a non-Roma and my sister and brothers are non-Roma. <laughs> so we were counted like this. And uh, not mentioning that that uh, most of the numbers that you see around Europe today is self-declaration. Uh, so we need much better data and we must uh, produce an atmosphere where people dare to call themselves freely Roma and they dare to celebrate their culture and the cultural heritage that we share here in Europe. So this is about data and hate speech. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Vice President, for these concluding words. No, no need to, to comment on them. Thank you very much for sharing also this, this personal experience about self-identification. I think it's really a great conclusion for the event today. Uh, many thanks to all the speakers. Many thanks for the audience and the patience uh, uh, of the audience here that has been with us uh, all these uh, uh, almost, uh, almost two hours. Um, the event will be uh, available on YouTube very soon, in about a day, so you can uh, recast if you like. I'd like also to flag that we have published recently in the EPRS a briefing on understanding EU action and Roma inclusion, and I encourage you to read that briefing for those who want to know about uh, policy making in that field. Many thanks to you. I wish you a very good